the bride of the man-horse. In the morning of his 250th year, Sheparok the centaur went to the golden coffer, wherein the treasure of the centaurs was, and taking from it the hoarded amulet that his father, Jishik, in the years of his prime, had hammered from mountain gold and set with opals bartered from the gnomes, he put it upon his wrist, and said no word, but walked from his mother's cavern, and he took with him too that clarion of the centaurs, that famous silver horn that in its time had summoned to surrender seventeen cities of man, and for twenty years had brayed at star-girt walls in the siege of Tholden Blarna, the citadel of the gods. What time the centaurs waged their fabulous war and were not broken by any force of arms, but retreated slowly in a cloud of dust before the final miracle of the gods that they brought in their desperate need from their ultimate armory. He took it and strode away, and his mother only sighed and let him go. She knew that today he would not drink at the stream coming down from the terraces of Varpa Niger, the inner land of the mountains, that today he would not wander a while at the sunset and afterwards trot back to the cavern again to sleep on rushes pulled by rivers that know not man. She knew that it was with him as it had been of old with his father, and with Gum, the father of Jishik, and long ago with the gods. Therefore, she only sighed and let him go. But he, coming out from the cavern that was his home, went for the first time over the little stream, and going round the corner of the crags saw glittering beneath him the mundane plain, and the wind of the autumn that was gilding the world, rushing up the slopes of the mountain, beat cold on his naked flanks. He raised his head and snorted. I am a man-horse now, he shouted aloud, and leaping from crag to crag he galloped by valley and chasm, by torrent bed and scar of avalanche, until he came to the wandering leagues of the plain, and left behind him forever the Athraminorian mountains. His goal was Zritazula, the city of Sambelene. What legend of Sambelene's inhuman beauty or of the wonder of her mystery had ever floated over the mundane plain to the fabulous cradle of the centaur's race, the Athraminorian mountains, I do not know. Yet in the blood of man there is a tide, an old sea current rather, that is somehow akin to the twilight, which brings him rumors of beauty from however far away, as driftwood is found at sea from islands not yet discovered. And this spring tide of current that visits the blood of man comes from the fabulous quarter of his lineage, from the legendary, the old. It takes him out to the woodlands, out to the hills. He listens to ancient song. So it may be that Sheparok's fabulous blood stirred in those lonely mountains, away at the edge of the world, to rumors that only the airy twilight knew and only confided secretly to the bat, for Sheparok was more legendary even than man. Certain it was that he headed from the first for the city of Zritazula, where Sambelene in her temple dwelt. Though all the mundane plain, its rivers and mountains, lay between Sheparok's home and the city he sought. When first the feet of the centaur touched the grass of that soft alluvial earth, he blew for joy upon the silver horn. He pranced and caracoled. He gambolled over the leagues. Pace came to him like a maiden with a lamp, a new and beautiful wonder. The wind laughed as it passed him. He put his head down low to the scent of the flowers. He lifted it up to be nearer the unseen stars. He reveled through kingdoms, took rivers in his stride. How shall I tell you, ye that dwell in cities, how shall I tell you what he felt as he galloped? He felt for strength like the towers of Bel Narana, for lightness like those gossamer palaces that the fairy spider builds twixt heaven and sea along the coasts of Zith for swiftness like some bird racing up from the morning to sing in some city's spires before daylight comes. He was the sworn companion of the wind. For joy he was as a song. The lightnings of his legendary sires, the earlier gods, began to mix with his blood. His hooves thundered. He came to the cities of men, and all men trembled, for they remembered the ancient mythical wars, and now they dreaded new battles and feared for the race of man. 
Not by Cleo are these wars recorded. History does not know them, but what of that? Not all of us have sat at historians' feet, but all have learned fable and myth at their mother's knees. And there were none that did not fear strange wars when they saw Shepherok swerve and leap among the public ways. So he passed from city to city. By night he lay down unpanting in the reeds of some marsh or a forest. Before dawn he rose triumphant and hugely drank of some river in the dark, and splashing out of it would trot to some high place to find the sunrise, and to send echoing eastwards the exultant greetings of his jubilant horn. And lo, the sunrise coming up from the echoes, and the plains new lit by the day, and the leagues spinning like water flung from atop, and that gay companion, the loudly laughing wind, and men, and the fears of men, and their little cities. And after that, great rivers, and waste spaces, and huge new hills, and then new lands beyond them, and more cities of men, and always the old companion, the glorious wind. Kingdom by kingdom slipped by, and still his breath was even. It is a golden thing to gallop on turf in one's youth, said the young man-horse, the centaur. Ha ha, said the wind of the hills, and the winds of the plain answered. Bells pealed in frantic towers. Wise men consulted parchments. Astrologers sought of the portent from the stars. The aged made subtle prophecies. Is he not swift? said the young. How glad he is, said the children. Night after night brought him sleep, and day after day lit his gallop, till he came to the lands of the Athelonian men, who live by the edges of the mundane plain, and from them he came to the lands of legend again, such as those in which he was cradled on the other side of the world, and which fringe the marge of the world and mix with the twilight. And there a mighty thought came into his untired heart, for he knew that he neared Zrita Zula now, the city of Sombelene. It was late in the day when he neared it, and clouds colored with evening rolled low on the plain before him. He galloped on into their golden mist, and when it hid from his eyes the sight of things, the dreams in his heart awoke, and romantically he pondered all those rumors that used to come to him from Sombelene, because of the fellowship of the fabulous things. She dwelt said evening secretly to the bat in a little temple by a lone lake shore. A grove of cypresses screened her from the city, from Zrita Zula of the climbing ways. And opposite her temple stood her tomb, her sad lake sepulcher with open door, lest her amazing beauty and the centuries of her youth should ever give rise to the heresy among men that lovely some Bellene was immortal, for only her beauty and her lineage were divine. Her father had been half centaur and half god. Her mother was the child of a desert lion and that sphinx that watches the pyramids. She was more mystical than woman. Her beauty was as a dream, was as a song. The one dream of a lifetime dreamed on enchanted dews, the one song sung to some city by a deathless bird blown far from his native coasts by a storm in paradise. Dawn after dawn on mountains of romance, or twilight after twilight could never equal her beauty. All the glowworms had not the secret among them, nor all the stars of night. Poets had never sung it, nor evening guessed its meaning. The morning envied it. It was hidden from lovers. She was unwed, unwooed. The lions came not to woo her because they feared her strength, and the gods dared not love her because they knew she must die. This was what evening had whispered to the bat. This was the dream in the heart of Sheparok as he cantered blind through the mist. And suddenly, there at his hooves in the dark of the plain, appeared the cleft in the legendary lands, and Zrita Zula sheltering in the cleft and sunning herself in the evening. Swiftly and craftily, he bounded down the upper end of the cleft, and entering Zrita Zula by the outer gate which looks out sheer on the stars, he galloped suddenly down the narrow streets. Many that rushed out onto balconies as he went clattering by, many that put their heads from glittering windows, are told of in olden song. Sheparok did not tarry to give greetings or to answer challenges from marital towers. He was down through the earthward gateway like the thunderbolt of his sires, and like Leviathan who has leapt at an eagle, 
he surged into the water between temple and tomb. He galloped with half-shut eyes up the temple steps, and, only seeing dimly through his lashes, seized some Bellinay by the hair, undazzled as yet by her beauty, and so hailed her away, and, leaping with her over the floorless chasm, where the waters of the lake fall unremembered away into a hole in the world, took her we know not where, to be her slave for all centuries that are allowed to his race. Three blasts he gave as he went upon that silver horn that is the world-old treasure of the centaurs. These were his wedding bells. <laughs>